Let me give it, let me do a little intro. We got Dylan Nathaniel all the way from OC California with releases on Sola, Insomniac, well forthcoming Sola, Insomniac, Repopulate, South of Saturn, Glasgow Underground, uh all my friends, Big Beat, Tool Room, Confession, Night Bass, Seven Wallace, Solo Toko, and so much more. Um, man, how are you doing today, brother? I'm doing awesome, man. Thank you for having me on here. Like, you know, this is this is super cool. Okay, let me. I'm gonna turn your volume up a little bit on my side. Um, yeah, man. Thanks for coming. I'm excited for your set on Wednesday uh, for a couple more with the crew. Shout out the couple more crew. Couple uh, more crew. <laughs> so uh, right off the bat, let's let's get started. Um, you, so how did it all start? How did you get into um, becoming the superstar producer DJ that you are? What was the first step in that? <laughs> how did you get introduced to electronic music um yeah so ever since i was like about eight or nine my dad really got into like trance music and he was always playing like armin van buren and stuff in the car and then he got into like carl cox and like sasha and dick weed and like all this really like classic house and there was this mix that he used to play all the time that aired in orange county it was called element radio and um uh, that's kind of how I first got introduced to house music was just in the car with my dad, just cruising. And like, it just kind of like, I don't know, like subliminally, I never really liked it up until like, yo, turn your mic up a little tiny bit. Tur yeah, I got you. Just a hair. But, okay, cool. cool. But yeah, no. So it was just more about like vacations and my dad introducing me into house music and stuff. But, um, I never lived with my dad because I was always like, I lived in Texas and I uh, would go see my dad in California uh, for the summers and stuff. But he ended up taking me to EDC when I turned 16. Oh, and shit. That's pretty much that changed the whole game for me. You know? Techno dad. Tech, super techno dad. You, you've met my dad. Yeah, before. your dad's my your dad. dad's awesome. Your dad came to the first holy moly uh, party that we did in OC. You, your dad, and yeah. your lady. I was like, man, the whole family's here. Yeah. It's, it's always a big family kind of vibe. Like, my aunt and my uncle are the people that got my dad into electronic music. So, I mean, anytime, like, you're in California, you guys drop by a show, and you'll see my dad, my Hell aunt, yeah. my uncle, all their friends. So, I love it. I love it. He, man, he must be so proud. Um, so, let's, so, let's keep going through it. So, after... You went to EDC when you were 16. What, what, let's even go deeper than that. What at EDC really caught your attention that like inspired you to be like, oh shit, this is like the coolest thing in the freaking world? Well, like when I was 16, I ended up moving to California. I moved away from my mom's house in Texas, moved in with my dad, started like a brand new life here. Um, I had this homie, his name is Llama. And he, we just used to listen to Dead Mouse, and like that was the first time that I ever heard Dead Mouse. And we were listening to like The Reward Is Cheese and like all these old Wolfgang Gartner records. And oh yeah, I never really got into it until like the electro house phase. You know, like that whole big wave of electro house is what really inspired me. Um, and then seeing it live at EDC, I ended up watching Dead Mouse for the first time live, and it was pretty much at that moment where I realized I was like, man, I think I want to make this kind of music, like and try to get into this this is like the coolest lifestyle ever like everybody's so open-minded everyone's so loving and like respectful so it was just like it made a lot of sense because i never really found my identity until i went to edc and it kind of became that little raver kid and then you know it's, it's kind of funny too because going back to school and raving wasn't that popular you were like the weird kid if you liked raves back then yeah you know I think that's why why we were drawn to it. Even you know, I went to school probably a long time before you did, but that was the same thing. I was I remember listening to Jungle on my headphones and listened to it as loud as possible so that the people next to me could hear it, and they'd be like, "What the fuck is that shit that you're listening to?" Like nobody wanted anything to do with it, but there was a little core 
group of kids that we used to go to raves together and be into music. So it's like, that's that's the appeal to me. That's the underground. That's why I was just like, man, that shit that the other people don't know about, all about that. Right. You felt like like almost like a part of an ex- exclusive type of club. You know? Yeah. Or if you knew, you knew, and then then it just attracted like all the friends that I was hanging out, all the music I was into, and just like passing back records back and forth. And then uh, at that time too, my dad is actually the one who got like this little uh, M audio controller it was like a four channel usb super old school controller um and he got that so he could learn how to dj and i never really like thought about it i was like all right i played the guitar and stuff and sang and i was like that kid and then i started messing around with his dj equipment at his house and i ended up just taking over and like taking it and my uncle bought me like my first set of headphones and then all of this other equipment and my laptop. And then I really, really got into like, you know, DJing big at that time. So, so how, how long was that from when you went to EDC to when you first got, let's say Ableton? Is that um, what you started well, with was Ableton? No, I started with Evel studio. Oh, so cool. I always had a PC. Um, my, like we got this laptop and my dad was like, you know, uh, I'm going to, I bought FL studio for your brother. Cause you know, he was trying to get my brother to do something like produce or just whatever, just kind of kill the time and stuff. And, um, I ended up using his key to use FL studio and I tried to record myself playing the guitar on it. That was initially what I wanted to do with it. But then, uh, after EDC and after getting like the DJ controller and stuff, I was like, you know what, I'm going to try to make like, house music and like do like four to the four patterns and stuff and like drum machines hell yeah so that, that was just like a cool journey too from like being somebody that was more into playing the guitar and kind of translating that into uh trying to make more house music and obviously it's, it's probably sounded super shitty at first of course i mean that that's the a funny thing or at least for me is that I play guitar too and I would try to record and use guitar in like my tracks and it just never sounded right. And like, even to this day, like every time I try it, it's like, I'm just going to play a synth instead. Like, it's like yeah. I, I never actually get a, a, unless it's like a sample of something old or something, but I've never been successful at like putting any of my own guitar. Do you put any of your own guitar in your tracks? Um, like I used to never, but now I'm kind of getting back into the roots of like where I started. And now I I feel like laying down a live bass on top of a synth bass, just to get that like extra layer in the track or like playing a light guitar, like something that you can almost barely recognize in the background, but it's more of like, I like the rhythm of the funk, like funky dead notes. And like having that kind of groove in your track too gives it a little bit more organic feel to it. So, totally. Um, so, so where did so from Fruity Loops to that's how old I am. I still call it Fruity Loops. From Fruity Loops, from <laughs> FL Studio to uh, Ableton. When did that switch happen? So, um, actually, I'll just kind of get go more into the story a little bit. Um, when I was a senior in high school and Costa Mesa high school, um, they had an, uh, audio engineering. It was a music tech class. Oh, sick. And that was kind of how I got introduced, um, into like more of the technical aspect of things instead of just jamming on a computer on FL studio or mixing with a little M audio software. Um, I really got into logic at first because the music tech class, my algebra two teacher was my music tech teacher. And like, he was really obsessed with uh, audio engineering and all that kind of stuff. And he had like a reggae band back in the day. And um, he awesome. really inspired me to like get into logic and music tech class was first period. And, you know, like back then, like all the kids, we would get like meet up before school, smoke a bunch of weed and then go to school, like, like stone and make beats like first period. And that that's was, what like, we do all day now. Anyway, you've been doing this for years. <laughs> I know it's just like that started like to develop that habit and that habit never died like even to this day it's like you know but um taking that inspiration from that class uh after high school 
I kind of realized I didn't want to go to a normal college or a normal university. I was like, I really want to be an audio engineer and I needed to find a way to make money off of just doing music and stuff. And I was like, I don't care what it is, as long as it's music is involved and I can record people, even if I'm not making music myself, I wanted to be involved in music. So uh, when I graduated high school, um, I ended up going to Musicians Institute in Hollywood and moving away um, out of my dad's house, got an apartment um, and just kind of threw myself into this two year audio engineering course. And it was, uh, you know, probably life changing to the way that I do everything nowadays, because um, I know a lot of people, they don't really take the engineering route because it's so meticulous it's so particular about like frequencies and calculating reverbs and it's a lot of science and math involved and it's like not as inspiring but um went through engineering school met a ton of dope people in hollywood uh i started interning at um atlantic records and i was just pretty much like a coffee runner like doing a lot of bitch boy work for like you know six did you meet some people there though yeah, I met a lot of uh, people like at that moment that really influenced the next stages of my life. And um, I think it was like six months into my internship where I realized they're not teaching me anything at this internship anymore. Uh, I'm just pretty much running coffees like I'm not like moving up at this company. And I think it was like three months later, I decided to quit and I didn't want to do audio engineering as a lifestyle anymore because it was just like. I wanted to go back to making beats and go back into like making my own stuff. And um, at that time, I think like Porter Robinson, say my name hit number one on Beatport. And it was like this huge wave of like electro turning into like fidget house almost. And that was like a really, really big key moment for me. Cause at, at that point it was Porter Robinson that really inspired me to hmm. try to pick, pick back up as, as an artist and go that way. And, um, I used to DJ at this club back in OC called Merge and it was a dubstep drum and bass club. And then they did a side room that was like Electro House. And uh, one of the instructors at Icon Collective, Sean Blakey, is the guy that runs Merge and OC. Or we used to be Merge, but um, started talking to him more, started playing in the main room, like playing house music for all these dubstep people. And it was like really aggressive house. So all the dubstep people were like, what the fuck is this? This is like the sickest shit I've ever heard. This oh, is yeah. like fast paced and danceable, like dubstep. Um, but Sean introduced me to Icon Collective. He was like, I really like your production. Your DJ skills are, are great. Like if you want to take it to the next level, you need to come to Icon Collective. And that was kind of the moment where I stepped back and I was like, you know, if I really, really want to do this, then I got to throw myself into it. And you know, a few weeks later, I had my orientation at Icon and signed up on the spot and just kind of went that whole direction, too. Hell yeah. Shout out Icon Collective. Um, Shout out Icon. <laughs> so, man, yeah, so that's that's quite the journey. So then there you started making beats. Yeah, it was more of like getting out of the engineer mindset of like mixing or like trying to make sound quality better, but like how to become an artist, how to become creative, uh, how to believe in yourself, really. Because uh, at the time, Mac J was like the star of Icon. Like, he was the, the class before me, and he received like a lot of support from Hardwell and all these big EDM DJs. And the big room house wave took a huge boom at that point, too. And it was like all the big room kicks with the one sound. Um, that was very, very popular. And... We were all really inspired by Mac J, and I was in the same class as Sam Jaws, um, so we really helped each other out a lot during that time. I was over at his house; he was over at my house every single day. Um, I was teaching him mixing skills; he was teaching me sound design, and that's kind of where my sound really took it to the next level. It was like Sick. incorporating my engineering skills with more of the way that Sam was doing these funky, weird crazy sounds and then we can kind of started meshing together and um, working a lot together so i like i definitely owe sam like a huge huge portion of the way that i do things even to this day so like 
you know, shout out to Jaws. Um, he's still my boy. <laughs> oh yeah, shout out Jaws. Shout out Mac J. Shout out Icon. Um, every time I go to OC or California, Southern California, I usually stop by CU. I usually stop by Icon. I usually uh, I always make sure I go out to OC just because there's so many amazing homies that are out there between you and Stranger and uh, or Adam Flinch and um, man, I I don't know. I I love OC is it's great because it's like just enough outside of LA that yeah, it's like it's close enough. Yeah, to LA that you go do stuff in LA, but like you can kind of escape that hustle and bustle and like that that like. I don't know. LA, I love LA. I was born in LA, you know, lived there for a while. Um, nothing against it, but it, it is grimy as fuck. Like if you ever think, if you've never been to LA, you think like Hollywood, Beverly Hills, you think of like the cleanest areas and like you actually go to LA, you go to downtown, you see Skid Row, you see all the homeless people. It smells like piss and shit everywhere. And there's graffiti tagged up, but that's what really brings that culture and that diversity you know totally totally um so shit man you have uh uh well i guess why don't we keep going with that so then after you graduate from icon um yeah after after icon um, when did you get into ableton was that around then yeah. ableton was uh, icon they make you take logic classes and ableton classes so then i obviously made the jump i bought my first macbook kind of left fl studio behind and at first i was trying to use fl studio and bounce stems and kind of throw it into ableton but then um one of the instructors paul lasky he lask uh he's like the ableton god and he showed me all like the way that he did his workflow and it felt way more human like we could actually jam out recording things in session view, throwing it back in and just like get more of like a live kind of band feel, which was, I was more familiar with playing the guitar. And I started doing that in Ableton. So, but after graduating Icon, it even took a while too, because, you know, I ended up living at my grandparents' house, just hustling, scraping by, like didn't have very much money, just working whatever job I could. I, I worked at Quicksilver and like, bunch of retail stores like Macy's and shit. And then um, I ended up getting an opportunity to work at a grow house, like to, to cut weed and trim weed and help grow. So that's some California shit. Yeah. <laughs> so honestly, that, that probably saved my whole life because I would go trim for two weeks, stack up mad cash. And then I had like two weeks to focus on just whatever it is that I want to do. And instead of blowing my money and going to party, I really fucking isolated myself um, in a house with uh, one of my best friends, Shot by Dilate. Uh, he's my photographer. I also make tons of music with him all the time. And he's like a big, big uh, help to everything that I do. And um, pretty oh, yeah, much he that's the homie. Of, uh, yeah, he's the homie, bro. And it was, uh, it was really cool because we sort of developed our own sound then. But um, it wasn't really until I met Dateless, and Dateless lives in Costa Mesa, and I never knew about Dateless, and I was just barely getting into Dirty Bird at that time. Like I think like Justin Martin and all of that. It was like the early, early Claude days of like uh, like some of the old, old Dirty Bird records, and um, Javier was showing me more of that, and he really wanted to be like a Dirty Bird style, and I had more of like this electro aggressive house style um so then we can kind of started making music together i was showing him more mixing stuff and he's the guy that really brought me into more of what, how important rhythm is and like how rhythm is everything in music and you can keep it really simple as long as the rhythm is is really really sexy and he's latin you know he's argentinian and uh he he just has this vibe about him he just carries himself in such a amazing way that it, it really reflected on me of like damn i want that kind of confidence you know i want that like same rhythm that you have and then uh we started making a bunch of tunes together and it really changed my sound because i started slowing the records down i wasn't using as like much as like a an aggressive type of growl 
bass in anymore. It was more of like, all right, we were really into Shiba song at the time. And then um, we got our first EP signed together. And that was the first label release I ever had. And it was on Audiophile XXL hmm. uh, back in the day. And, that was when Steve Darko uh, was a and Was that No, was that uh, this was before Steve Darko. Uh, Robert Pennington was the label owner. And then they had Audiophile Deep, which was more like a deep house. Then XXL is supposed to be more like a, a modern type of house, more kind of like Dirty Bird and Night Bass fused together. And you can kind of hear that in a lot of those records. It's like a lot of like growly sounds, but Sheba ended up supporting our first EP. And then that was that pivotal moment where I was like, all right, now I think we're actually professionals. You know, we're getting professional DJs to play the records, people that we look up to. And it really, really took it from there. Um, and at the time, too, Robert was pretty good friends with AC Slater, uh, Aaron, and he was sending my tunes to Aaron at that same time. And I really owe Robert probably everything to my career because it was at that moment uh, AC Slater heard my stuff and signed my first EP to Night Bass, that Fresh Squeeze EP. Um, okay. I did a boom bap on on their compilation, and it was like a – from there, it really took off because I started playing all the night bass shows and he started inviting me uh, to travel to play all the night bass stuff. And it was uh, those were my first shows that I ever really played. Man, those are great shows to play. I got to say, my some of my favorite shows that I've maybe ever played, um, just the vibe at the night bass shows is how, how crazy the kids go and how many kids show up for that. It's just like so crazy. Um, yeah. So so yeah so then night base uh you did got you got the AC Slater support you got uh um playing some night base shows and then when was it this was maybe like 3 4 years ago or longer than that Um that was yeah it was actually I think it was 4 years ago I got the memory on my phone and it said night Fuck base yeah. the first flyer it was like uh AC Slater uh I think it was like Chris Lorenzo uh, and then it was PD clicks and then I opened the night up and then that was like, I just remember being so nervous, like sweating, uh, <laughs> like throwing up before the show, like just all this anxiety. And like, I just wanted to deliver because it was like, you know, these people signed me to my label. I wanted to put on a good show, you know, and I brought Javier with me. I brought our date list with me. I brought the whole crew, the whole family came out, everyone came and it was just like, that was the point where I knew that, like, I can do this. Where, was like, that at Sound? Yeah, it was at Sound. Nice. Sound nightclub in Los Angeles, one of the dopest uh, nightclubs in all of LA because it's more 300 person cap, very intimate, you know. Yeah, man, I love that club. Um, so then, so then from from this night base, you know, more I would say on like a bass house kind of tip to. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of, I mean, I feel like that's how we all kind of start out as artists and then we kind of click with certain people and we kind of get pulled one direction or another. And then eventually, uh, we kind of break out of our shell into like, exactly you, we, it's almost like you hone in you're like, this is me. You're like, you're finding yourself basically right along the years and eventually you 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 grow into the artist now i would say you know like so how did that get to where now you're doing like really big releases on every big label for the kind of i don't even know how you, you like it's like tech house but how would you explain like what you're doing now so you got what before we even go any further it's got a big LP ep coming out on on sola was that friday Friday, uh, yeah, right? It's Friday. Cool, cool. And uh, did releases on both of uh, Lee Foss's labels, um, and so much, so much more. But, but explain, give us a little background on how you went from opening at the night base thing to now you're, you know, headlining and releasing tunes all over the place. Yeah, for sure. Um, like it was at that time too where I was playing a lot of night bass parties. I was opening up a ton of them, doing a lot more. And I kind of asked my manager at the time, like, all right, so what's the next step now? Like, how do we go 
and develop this in and take it a little bit further. Um, and a label that just came about, like very first releases, um, was Confession, and it was Chami's label. Uh, Chami and Mala run Confession, and uh, I think it was like a Dombreski record that I heard on Confession, and I was obsessed with. It was uh, I forgot what it's called, but it, it's such a groovy tune, and I played it in all the night bass parties, and it would go off in the night bass parties. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to try to send some music to Confession. Sent them a bunch of music. Never heard anything back from them. I was like, all right, maybe it's not the right right fit, not the right vibe. Um, I ended up send, sending Mala to, just to his promo email, a record called Resonate. And that was like another explosion moment in my career because um, a couple weeks later, I didn't hear back from him. I was just on Instagram scrolling. Um, and then it still gives me the chills thinking about it. Um, Hell yeah. But I, I saw, I heard resonate. Uh, Mala was playing it in a New York show in your, your hood. And that shit exploded. Like the whole crowd was going crazy. And I'd never heard that sort of energy tied with my music before. And it was like, almost like I was still dreaming. Like what the fuck? Like Mala just played my record in front of all these people and they're going crazy about it. And, then Man, that's every the best. Uh, yeah, on that whole tour that he played, he opened up with my song every single time, and everyone thought that that tune was Mala and was asking, "ID, ID, what the hell is this? What the hell is this?" Um, and then he hit me back two weeks later after the tour was kind of dying down, and he said that he's doing a, a, a compilation on Confession, and we're doing an illegal mixtape, and then he ended up signing Resonate to Confession and. I still think to the to this day I still get requests to play that record all the time, you know, even though that's not the sound that I do anymore. But um, I think it was like at that point I signed a couple more EPs to Confession, the Frequent EP, and I was doing a lot more of the Confession sound. And it's funny that you say that because when you do get signed a label, you are inspired to write that kind of music, right? Like. You get signed somewhere and then now you just keep making these records that sound more like the label instead of more like yourself. Um, and that, that's, that's great too to grow as an artist, but people don't always, always realize we're not just artists, we're also people too. And as you grow as a person, you know, your music taste changes as you grow up. That's just the way it is. We're not listening to records we did five years ago because- Big facts. You know, um, so it was really at that point um, where I met my current manager on Holy Ship. And it was funny because, uh, I guess let me backtrack a little bit. Golf Clap. Shout out Golf, Golf Clap. Clap. Ended up finding my, my music on Confession and they kind of wanted to break away from doing Tech House and doing more bassy stuff. So we ended up linking up. They came over to my house. We produced a, a few records together and... Um, I helped them out a lot with uh, mixing and audio engineering stuff, and they were really grateful. And they invited me on Holy Ship back in 2018. I remember um, that. Yeah, 2018, Holy Ship. That was such a crazy experience. I'd never been on anything like that before. Um, I met Destructo. I met all these people. It was like such a cool moment. And then um, Destructo ended up finding my music. And then he... Uh, took me on tour after Holy Ship, but uh, I met my manager on Holy Ship right now, um, Gio from Aida, and we have like Chris Lake and Dombreski and Noizu and all those boys, um, Born Dirty. But um, it was kind of like at that point too, where I realized the sound that I was doing was more like Mala and Chami. It was more like AC Slater. I didn't really have my own identity in all of this. Like, how do we take it and, and expand a little bit further? Um, so Chris Lake ended up finding um, my records and sort of mentored me and, and helped me realize, you know, I have a very masculine sound. It's like a very masculine energy about the music. It's very heavy, aggressive. Is that how he how described we, it? That sounds yeah, like how, how yeah. he would describe it. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, he said, uh, your sound is very masculine. <laughs> you get the girls on the dance floor you get the guys on the dance floor and i was like that's so true like i'm making music for the boys you know like like back in my high school days when we were listening to electro house and very heavy stuff and 
I started to think about more about the roots of, of like when I was a kid and how my dad showed me how, like Sasha and Digweed and Carl Cox. And then I listened to a, a bunch of Carl Cox sets after that. And I was literally blown away by how I almost identified with that, you know, in that whole aspect. And Carl Cox was probably the guy that changed the way I, I thought about music because Carl Cox was went from hardcore to really, really deep house to break beats to tech house to techno. And he really showed that you can evolve as an artist. Your fans are going to stick with you no matter what. And if you're not progressing, then you're being stagnant and, you know, always got to keep on, on the move and always got to keep progressing. So uh, that ended up being a really, really cool thing for me because um, getting signed with Aida and that management team, going on tour with Destructo um, and just being mentored a little bit more by Chris helped me realize that, like, I wanted to create my own identity and I never wanted to stray away from the tone and the, the dirtiness, but I guess I would describe my sound now as very, very dark and groovy and still like that bassy tech house. You know what I mean? You know, there's like a lot of tribal tech house or like a visa tech house. I feel still bass heavy. Like, yeah. It's LA bass heavy tech house, you know? And like, that's kind of how I describe my sound now and how I identify with that. And when we look at uh, even Solardo, uh, Eli Brown, all these guys were old drum and bass producers, old dubstep producers, uh, even Scream went from dubstep and did all the stuff that he's doing now. So it's like, I think uh, I was more inspired by the people that came from dubstep backgrounds without even realizing it. And you're like, okay, that makes sense to me. I, I think we've said this a couple of times on the show, but it always goes back to drum and bass. Always does. You can always follow the trail back. Uh, I used to, years ago, we had a a, a really long running weekly, dubstep weekly, I went by a completely different name, um, called Darkroom, and we brought Mark One, oh. who ended up being Solardo later on in life, but he was like, you know, he was one of the, like, OG dubstep dudes from, like, way back in the day. Yeah. And that's crazy. I didn't even know that you were going by that name because I would see those records and play those records and like. Oh no, no, that wasn't my name. That was that was the name of our night. Was Dark Room. I used to go then. Okay. Yeah, that was completely different. But they we had a, a weekly Friday night party called Dark Room, and we oh. first it was just all locals, and then we started doing bigger shows. And he was one of the guys that that we had at one of our first really big shows and then i never heard about him for a really long time and then all of a sudden Solardo just like blew the fuck up and you know so 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 how how did that happen so so you uh got man a new ep is is fire is always fire you know another thing with this kid is that anytime i would go over to his house or he, he would i would see how many tracks they would have finished. I'd be trying to finish like, you know, maybe I could get a few done in a month or a week or something like that. This kid will have like 20, 30 tracks that he's just sitting on, never going to put out probably. And like, like, like nothing, like just how, how many tracks are you sitting on right now? Like 300? I'd <laughs> say tracks that I'm like really interested in releasing probably like around 50, but you know, there's only so many you can get in in a year, you know? You're not. So so that's what's coming up next. How did that come about, the, the release with Sola? So at the time, uh, my manager right now was uh, touring with Fisher. He was tour managing Fisher um, everywhere. And I had sent just demos to Solardo because I was so into that sound. I wanted to get on Sola so bad and really prove myself to them and get them to play a record. So I made Do It Again, um, sent it to his email, never heard anything back, but I saw on SoundCloud that he downloaded the track. So, or Solardo downloaded the track. So I was like, okay, we'll see what happens. Come, comes like flash forward, like three weeks later when my uh, manager is on tour with Fisher, Solardo played right after or right before, right after Fisher or whatever. And then one of the last songs they played was do it again. And then my manager just 
flipped his shit, took out his phone, filmed the video, sent it to me. I was like, oh shit, this is so sick. Like they're playing the record. Maybe they want to sign it. I went immediately to the studio and produced the B-side to do it again, let me know. And very, very same type of vibe, very same type of tip. Um, sent them that record and then they said they wanted to sign the EP. So Fuck that yeah. was a really cool moment. So uh, you also have Rowetta on there who's like a classic diva house goddess. So how did, how did you get her on there to... To, to do the record well everyone knows you know when you make a record you kind of throw a scratch vocal in right just just to get the essence of like uh what vibe you're going for uh i think i was searching through some old soul records like some gospel not even like trying to find like disco records because everyone's touching the disco acapellas but i went and found some some gospel uh through the weather was right i think is the song and i through that vocal on um, the track was now Reason to Fly, but um, it was, wasn't was even named yet. And I sent them that tune and they want, we, we tried for like, I think six months to clear that sample and it just never happened, you know? And at that point, Solardo was like, both of them were like, we really, really want to sign this record, but we need to get the vocals redone. Is it okay if we get someone to bring them in they just put out that one record with her too. That makes sense. And it was super cool. Cause it was like, I didn't even get a chance to meet her still, but she just crushed that session. They recorded the vocals for me, sent that's me the amazing. dry stem and I threw it in and uh, did some processing. And then that's how reason to fly came about. And hell yeah. Well, shit, man. Uh, that sounds like there's a good possibility. Maybe we'll get a Salardo Dylan Nathaniel collab sometime soon. Yeah, that would be huge for sure. Um, well, shit. Let's see. You know, I was—I didn't even get a chance. I had all kinds of stuff, and we are almost fucking into an hour. That's why I love this kind of shit. Okay, so, um, what about like how about we, how the talking about how we met? You know, like you remember like the first time that we ended up meeting? I don't completely remember i i've i remember being at your house because your roommate was like or what what was it before you even met me yeah and like we were like maybe we we're internet homies i don't even remember but like um i was at focus i think no was it focus or night based party yeah, something in oc i was staying with stranger like i said every time i go to la i usually go out to oc and i stay with my buddy adam uh stranger aka flinch aka my favorite one of my favorite people in the world like and i stay on his couch and we write music and smoke bongs and eat mexican food and like every single time and then you like live really you guys live really close by and somehow i ended up going to what it what is folk was a place called it focus is at it was at tapas i think back then it was like a mexican joint back then <laughs> it was i forget where it was but i ended up going to they're like oh uh somehow i ended up at your house smoking weed with everybody and and uh trying to scratch on on one of your turntables or something and the mixer was broken and and I was like, "Yo, dude, I'm in your house." And you you were you were on tour, I think. You were playing somewhere. Uh, but I don't. When do you know? When was? Where did we actually meet? I think um, we met probably uh, through a show with the Golf Club. I, I believe. I think we did something country club disco or something. But uh, we we definitely were associated online, and just I, you know, I was already listening to your music before and. I think you were checking out my tunes and yeah it was funny because you sent me a message you're like yo i'm at your crib right now <laughs> like there's a party happening and every time i was gone there was always a party happening yeah you, i think it was like, it was brian I, I used to play there's a kendrick lamar edit that you did that i used to oh, play and then yeah. brian jones from golf club was always or formerly from golf club was always um being like, yo, this kid Dylan, this kid Dylan, he's he's fucking, he's so sick, and he would like tell me stuff that you showed him and stuff, and like, then it was just like, 
it's one of those things where it's it's almost like I think we're probably we'll get along good. We'll probably be friends, and then like we've been homies ever since. And like, um, I yeah. went to oh, we played a night base show. That was maybe one of the first or second night base parties I ever played in Atlanta. The Atlanta one. And they and they instead of getting hotels, we got like a night base like. It felt it was like the real world. It was like a big real yeah. world house where it's like everyone Gosh, had their right. own rooms, and yeah. uh, and I had to I had to fly out at like seven in the morning or eight in the morning, and I was like, "Don't let me go to sleep! Don't let me go to sleep!" I just remember waking you up like, "Bro, you're about to miss your fucking <laughs> flight!" Like, we partied at that house, raged afterwards with everybody, and if I almost felt like. AC Slater was like Uncle Slater at that time. He was Uncle Slater. Like putting us to bed, like, all right, kids, like, you know, like we had some people over at the Airbnb. He's like, all right, kids, we're going to bed. Like, let's shut it down. Like, he's like Uncle Slater, you know? Yeah, he was like, he was like, dude, we'll wake up and we'll go to the airport with you. And I was like, you guys don't got to wake up that early. And did it. They were up before I was and went to bed after I did, probably. And like, we're like, bro. You got to go no, to the airport. I passed out before, before everyone, because remember, you guys are all taking pictures next to me. Um, yeah, I was passed the fuck out. And, and like you and Aaron and like everyone was like taking pictures with me. Like my mouth is like wide open. Like, like this is this thing. is what this is why like people like us aren't meant to be in isolation and away from all this. This is why I'm so grateful for this Twitch stuff, because, you know, also, I love that we can like document history that you know maybe people will never hear or or it'll get forgotten about but also it's like man we are really good at having fun and we like to make music and write music and like uh like what's greater than that and like put us in a in a room in front of a whole bunch of people and play some music that we've been working on or whatever and it's like uh i cannot wait to get back to this kind of stuff so until now this is all this is all we kind of got um but so we we just gotta watch out for that dylan Coates tour coming in the near future boys and girls like i would love to go on a tour with you and smash it out again and that's literally going to be the greatest feeling in the world man well we'll do it proper because that was the shows we played before we were we were on the come up and like now it's like yeah let's do let's do a fucking my idea was we worked on a track a long time ago called Beefy, which oh yeah, it's just we were actually we could talk about that. Is like the uh, I, f- I had this app on my phone that changes your voice, and I just I don't even know how I got the idea to do it, but we hooked my phone into your computer and you could do celebrity voices, and I just kept saying it's really beefy, like so beefy, so beefy. <laughs> And like, but it was Steve sa- Harvey one too that we used. Yeah, it was it was through a Steve Harvey filter that didn't sound anything like Steve Harley or Harvey, and it was a funny track. It never came out. It probably never will come out. And like we just now, I, I had this idea. I was like, let's do a tour where we call it the Beefy Tour, and we'll get like the fat sumo costumes, and we'll do promo pics where we're like, right, and I, what the hell. <laughs> I think anyway. we should give the, the Discord fans, you should drop them a link or something. Just give it to to the or the Twitch Twitch fans, like give them a little The Beefy tune. You know, for free. Yeah, just give them beefy. Shit. <laughs> well well let's see, maybe we could do that. I don't even know if we ever finished it, but it's but I, I, think it's I always play it. Yeah, yeah. Shit, maybe we'll do that. You guys hear that? Um all right, so <laughs> What else? Okay, so so just a couple more things I wanted to touch on is that so you know now that the pandemic is going on, mm-hmm. uh, tour we 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 were not able to do any shows last year. Um, what are you doing to stay sane, to stay positive? Um, like, what are some tips? Like, that's kind of something big on this show as we tried to like give insight on on having hope and being positive because it's really hard. It's, it's, it's a tough time to even have hope or be positive because of whether it's finance or being sick or 
all kinds of health shit or just everything is just fucking up in the air right now. So, so are there any tips that you can give for people for, um, so to inspire some, some happy thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, the pandemic is literally an opportunity, you know, as much as everyone wants to be pessimistic about it, you know, we've gone through this in history before, maybe not to this extent, but we're going to come out of it. We got to be positive about it. And it's about almost hitting the reset button because, I, I know for you too, we were going on tour all the time. We were doing all this stuff so involved in our own lives that sometimes like you take, you don't take that time to become a human being again and reconnect with your family and your friends. And for me, this pandemic was all about strengthening my relationships with all my homies and my family and people that I might not have gotten the time to talk to anymore. So it was like strengthening those relationships, um, I started teaching Zoom lessons um, for the fans, so anyone that wants to learn how to produce and connecting with fans in that way. You're doing all this stuff, which is like, we never would have done this if we were still on nah. tour and hustling. So Crazy. that's a positive note. And then as well as I know, we talk about crypto and stocks and, and all that good stuff. So it's like, now we're thinking about financials of like, how do we increase the number of sources of income that we have? Because when all your eggs are in the touring basket, then you're kind of screwed when shit like this happens. Yeah. We're doing stocks. We're doing other things to, to earn money. You know, we have launched like a whole merch line and doing more intricate, like designing. And, um, you know, I'm getting married in June, which you're coming to the, to the wedding. So congratulations, brother. Sick. Thank you so much. Yeah. This guy, he's got awesome lady. Um, June, June. Oh shit. What? June will be my birthday, so I'll be sell. That'll be the best birthday present I've gotten. Dylan, Dylan and the lady getting married, June fourteenth. Nice. June seventeenth to wedding. We're gonna have oh, to do something. Oh shit! Oh shit, man. That's awesome. So, uh, so you know, and this is this again. Almost every time I talk to someone on here, that that's it's the same um, kind of positivity where it's like, you know. Obviously, it sucks to lose a year of touring to people's losing their business and all that. But there, this really is such a crazy opportunity to get healthy, like in your mind and your body and your music and your uh, and with your relationships and so much more if you let it. And it's like, uh. And all as well, like financially too, like that was all I was worried about was finishing tunes and touring. I was so narrow sighted for so long and it just gets deeper because it just gets more important and more people get involved and more money gets involved. And it's, and so like you, you, it's easy to lose sight of the important stuff, like your fa- the relationships with your family and friends. And I don't know if it's if it's the same thing with you, but I was always just like, man, I'm going to get it so big so that I can just take care of everybody. And it, and in the in the act of doing that, I missed out on a lot of stuff and I didn't see family or friends and I just kind of isolated myself in the studio and just stayed away from and then being at clubs all the time, it's like you're on a different schedule than everybody else in your life. So this has been a blessing where it's like, you know, I, I told you too, I, I moved back. I literally live up the street from my family now. So like I got out of the New York city hustle and bustle. And now I see my sister every day, basically my parents every day. And it's like the things that are really important, it helped this pandemic. Ironically, I think made a lot of other people, a lot of people healthier in, in a lot of different ways too. So I'm grateful of that. And, and no matter how weird that sounds, because, you know, the pandemic sucks, obviously, but you gotta, you gotta make do with the cards that were dealt. Um, right. Shit, man. Gotta count them blessings, brother. <laughs> gotta count them blessings. Um, so yeah. So I don't know if you're, if you're taking on any more, um, lessons or, but, you know, Dylan is a, a man of many trades, mixing, mastering, lessons, mentoring, um, 
all around grandmaster at all that stuff. So make sure. And where could everyone find you? All your stuff is just backslash Dylan Nathaniel, right? Yeah. I mean, please, any of you guys that are interested in lessons or just to chat or something, um, feel free to message me on Instagram. You know, one thing uh, the pandemic has allowed me to do as well is be able to answer all my DMs now. So that's, that's another plus. Um, I'm still pretty yeah. shitty at that, but uh, <laughs> you can always find me on Twitch. That's for sure. Um, now you're a bad texter, bro. You don't text back. Yeah, I'm, well. I'm bad at texting <laughs> too. Um, I think that I just get overwhelmed, and I'm like, "All right, I'll, I'll 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 text later another time." You're a bad texter too, brother. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, shit. Hold on. Was there there was one more thing? I think. Man, I think that just about. Co- oh, uh, I don't even know if he's in the chat, but uh, there's one one. Actually, there's a whole bunch of people that constantly ask me for that Faithless remix. That never did you ever put that out? No, it never okay. came out. Cool. So you're ever gonna put that out or you're gonna keep that as a as a nug? Obviously, um it was cool to tour with it. Uh, but that was like that more of the last year's kind of touring sound and I, I wanna put a bunch of stuff out for free, so I have all these edits that I wanna start releasing and being able to give that, but Anyone who has hit me up for that tune, I've already sent that to them. So cool, like, you cool, know, cool. If you want that tune? Hit me up, and I'll send it to you. <laughs> yeah, that's been that's definitely for a good year and a half, two years. I've that's been a a a, a hell of a tool in my my sets for sure. Um, and it's funny, I was just thinking about that because another thing before we go, I don't know if if you ever noticed, but this these people that hit me up and they're like, "Do you want?" this many more followers or whatever um or are you interested in this and i was like you know i'm all good but my my buddy dylan would love some and he told me so i would send them over and i would be like you should go talk to him did, did any of them ever tell you that i sent them no no one told me that but i swear to god i get like three or four of those a day you fucker you piece they're, of shit they're not all from me but there was actually there was one maybe there was two and I was just like, I think you weren't texting me back that day. And I was like, you know what? Dylan Nathaniel said that he would love for you to hit him up and is completely interested. <laughs> I always for, I, I forgot about that. And I was like, I got to ask you about that on the show. Um, that's super, that's super <laughs> shitty of you, bro. I'm just kidding. Um, no, but it's all it's all love, brother. I fucking I definitely love you, man. I'm so glad we got a chance to to chat and like it feels like we're hanging out right now. You know, what I, mean? I know, man. We 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 got to do this more often, and hopefully, eventually, I'm going to come out to California for a couple of weeks once this slows down a little bit more. It seems like we're going in a good direction. The numbers are down. You know, obviously, we're not out of the clear with this pandemic, but everything's the numbers are down. This is a fucking great thing. And that's all we can do is have hope and try to be positive. So anything else you want to plug or you got the Sola EP coming out on Friday or Sola EP is coming. We just announced Elements Festival, which is touching back on that positive note. What day what day are you doing? Oh yeah, we're doing the same day. Right? Yeah, Friday? Doing the same day. Yeah, fuck yeah. Yeah, Friday. Shout well, out Elements. Thank you guys for doing all of the proper precautions to be able to get this festival season back running. So. Yeah, because that was supposed to be May, and I think that was really, you know, responsible of them to 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 delay it again. You know, this is like it's almost being delayed two years now, a year and a half now. So that was the right move. You know, if if things aren't cool. When it gets close, I'm sure it'll get pushed again. But I, th- I'm being positive. I'm being hopeful, and and I'm looking forward to it. So I think that a lot of us need. So hopefully, we see some of the couple more crew uh, up at Elements this season. Um, or it's September, I think, right? Um, yep. So looking forward to your set for for Wednesday. A couple more every Wednesday on the Dirty Bird Channel. 11 p.m. EST, um, 8 p.m. for you Cali people. And shit, man, thank you so much for coming through. 
and uh, looking forward to seeing you, bro. Dude, I can't wait to give you a big hug in person and just fucking get back to it, man. Give your fiance a, a hug for me, and at the least, I'll see you. Hey, what up? What up? <laughs> um, and at, at the least, let's hop on a Zoom call. Let's work on some music. I'm down. Let's do it. <laughs> Are you got, shit? I didn't even get a chance to ask the the chat crew. Chat, you guys got any questions before we wrap it up? Yeah, that was a good one. <clears throat> Make sure you're following Dylan's twitch um we want to blow his twitch up gas shout out gas shout out speaker honey shout out mr bob dabalina and what up what up what up oh yeah that's that's another funny story but me and dylan got uh i gotta tell this one before we go me and dylan actually i was responsible for booking the miami room at for winter music conference my music week tour maybe it was two years ago and i got a room i must not have read it correctly but somehow we we get in and i'm like oh this is pretty straight we got a kitchen and like and then all of a sudden and is like yo i think i'm in your room and i'm like in my room He's like yeah we're roommates i'm like what and somehow I booked one that that we were we had roommates on Airbnb, and I didn't realize that that's the kind of room I booked. And out of all the people, all the freaking ravers that went to Miami for the music week, Anz is a roommate. How that was so crazy. fucking crazy one is of that? Our friends. We got into that room and we were like, why is the fucking master locked, man? This is bullshit. We both had to sleep in the living room on our like separate bed. So we were like sharing a room together. And then I remember being in my boxers, like literally the, cranking the AC because it was hot as balls. And then all of a sudden, Anne's walks in and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, how are you in, in here? And then I, I hit you up because you were like somewhere else, I think. And then I was like, you're never going to believe this. Like... I was like, no way, dude. I was like, no way. I was like, what are you talking about? I have the receipt and everything. And then I actually ended up getting a really big fight with the guy who owned it. But um, it was good times. That was that was a great, that was the best, to me, the best Miami so far. I was looking forward to this year, or last year. Obviously, it didn't happen. This year, obviously, didn't happen either. So hopefully that comes back. But if it doesn't, right. that was a great year to be the last one. Hopefully it's not. But anyway, let me let this guy go. Um, what's up, Samantha? Plus one, Rome one. Man, so many awesome people in here. Oh, what year did we two meet? Maybe, I want to say four years uh, ago? 2018. Yeah. Uh, 2018, 2017. Cool. Well, uh, thank, dude, thanks, bro. Thank you so much for having me, man. Like, this was so much fun. Thank you guys, everyone in the chat that stayed and listened to our story. Um, we really appreciate you guys. Yeah, make sure you guys tune in Wednesday. Um, if you feel like it, feel free to host the Dirty Bird page when we do it. I'll see you guys Wednesday. And then, of course, I'll see you Friday at Welcome to Code's House back on this channel. Thank you so much. Peace, Dylan. Much love, Good my time. brother. I'm going to end with um, – let's play the one with Ro Rowetta uh reason to fly we'll play a little snippet of that and oh damn thank you samantha thank you thank you thank you for the for the sub um we'll end with that one sneak peek at, at dylan's new tune i've been playing it on the shows like crazy and go follow this guy see you guys on sunday peace peace bye guys crew 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 man thank you guys so much for coming in that was a lot of fun Peace, peace.